Our sermon text this morning will be Ezekiel chapter 15. Ezekiel chapter 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, how does the wood of the vine surpass any wood? The vine branch that is among the trees of the forest. Is wood taken from it to make anything? Do people take a peg from it to hang any vessel on it? Behold, it is given to fire for fuel. When the fire has consumed both ends of it, and the middle of it is char charred, is it useful for anything? Behold, when it was whole, it was used for nothing. How much less, when the fire has consumed it, and it is charred, can it ever be used for anything? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I have given up the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face upon them. Though they escape from the fire, the fire shall yet consume them. And you will know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. And I will make the land desolate because they have acted faithlessly, declares the Lord. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our rock, our redeemer, and nearest kinsman. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that you immediately discover when reading through the books of the prophets, one of the things that we have been seeing in Ezekiel is that prophets do so much more than give speeches. They do so much more than just calmly and logically explain a situation to people and how God would have them respond. But rather, the prophets, all the prophets, communicate in ways that are designed to reach people where they need to be reached. They act and they live and they speak in ways to reach the hearts and minds and imaginations of the people. So what do God's prophets do? One thing we have seen in Ezekiel is that they act out. Ezekiel laid on a side for many years. He, he made model cities out of mud. He played with toy armies. He dug through the wall of his house. Other prophets we might see walking around the city preaching naked. Another prophet would wear the yoke of an ox. God called another prophet to marry a prostitute and to continue to abide with her unfaithfulness. All of these uh, acting out, all these uh, things to act out were designed to shock the people, to grab the imaginations of the people. The prophets tell stories and parables. Think about after David committed the sin with Bathsheba and Nathan comes, he does not come telling David, I know what you did, but he comes to David with a story. And when he gives David the story and David grabs onto the hook and says, that man must die, he then hits him with the punchline and tells David, you are the man. This grabbed onto David's heart in a way that no other communication could have. Over these next few chapters, Ezekiel will be telling parables and giving object lessons. In two chapters, he will tell stories comparing Jerusalem to a harlot. He will tell a strange story about a vine and two eagles. He will compose a piece of Hebrew poetry. And today, he gives us an object lesson asking us to consider the nature of vine wood. God comes and he tells Ezekiel to consider the nature of a vine. Now, of course, people in Ezekiel's day would have been much more rooted in agriculture, much more rooted to various types and uses of trees and plants. And so we might have to think about what, he, what the comparison is. Think about the vine, particularly in this case, the grape vine. What is it good for? If you know anything about vines, they're not particularly strong. They're not particularly large. You would not go to make a chair and think, I really need a piece of vine wood. You would not, it would break immediately sitting on it. It is not even strong enough. It, it's, not, it's about the size you might need for a peg. But as soon as you would try to hammer a piece of vine into a wall, it would splinter and fall apart. 
a piece of vine wood, if you just have a vine from the woods, it is not particularly useful except for only two things. First, to bear fruit, and second, to burn for fuel. Now, this passage does not talk about a vine bearing fruit, but as we'll see, other parts of Scripture do. This passage concerns the wood of a vine, a, a piece of vine that has been cut off because of its fruitlessness. The only thing that is left that you can do with vine wood is burn it for fuel. It is especially useful if you have a, a big pile of brush. That way you will have a fast, hot burning fire. And the image that God gives Ezekiel continues. And I want you to imagine you just had a, a large brush fire. And after it all burns down, you go around and what's left? You will probably have lots of sticks that are half burned. Right? Uh, uh, if you have a big brush fire, now everything gets burned up in the first big fire. And so you might gather and you might rake together all the sticks that are half burned, to have the end burned in the middle or still whole. And when you get that big pile, are the, are the sticks that are left, the vine that are left, are they any more useful or are they now less useful than they were before? Right? The example, God's uh, obvious answer is that these half burned pieces of vine are even less useful than they were before. The only thing that these are now good for is simply starting your next fire. And so God then tells Ezekiel that Jerusalem is like a vine. It is fruitless and therefore it is useless and good only to be given into the fires of judgment. And God has already brought Babylon into Jerusalem two times. If you remember, he, he brought him in one time and took out Daniel and Daniel's friends and other people. He brought Nebuchadnezzar back and he took out Ezekiel and his people that time. So he has already burned Jerusalem twice. And he says the only thing that Jerusalem is good for now is to be burned up completely, given up completely into the fire of judgment. Jerusalem is a fruitless, useless vine, good for nothing but judgment. That is the basic message of Ezekiel chapter 15. It makes for a very short sermon, except for one thing. That the Bible, the entire Bible, tells a story about people as vines who are fruitful or fruitless, cut off or grafted in, and Ezekiel is found right smack in the middle of that story. And so instead of just preaching Ezekiel 15, we are going to be looking at the entire Bible today, to which my sons were concerned about how long dad's going to preach for. <laughs> to really understand the full meaning of Ezekiel 15, we must trace the story of vines through the Bible. And the first thing we should understand about vines in the Bible is that they are so often used as symbols of people, right? Vines and are symbols of human beings. The Bible speaks of people as being vines and trees. And just go all the way back, if, if we have eyes to see that Adam, like a vine, was made from the ground, that Adam, like a tree, was placed into the garden, Adam was to fill the earth with the good fruits of his labor. Eve was to be like the wife in Psalm 128. She was to be a fruitful vine in Adam's house, as Adam was a fruitful vine throughout all the world, each of them in their own realm, filling the earth with good fruit. Humanity was called to fill the earth with the good fruits of their labor, called to spread the garden vineyard throughout all of God's creation. And after God called, uh, cursed Adam, after the fall, when God cursed Adam, both literally and symbolically, he said, Adam, you will no longer not only bring forth good fruit, but your work will also bring forth thorns, briars, and thistles. After the flood, we see Noah planting a vineyard, enjoying the fruits of his labors. The first time we see the word vine used in scripture is when Joseph is placed in the Egyptian prison. <laughs> And the cupbearer comes to him and says, I had a dream that I was looking at a vine, and on that vine were three branches with clusters of grapes, and I squeezed the grapes into a cup, and I gave that cup back to Pharaoh. 
And of course, Joseph, correctly interpreting that dream, would set off a series of events that would eventually bring all of his family down to Egypt, all of Israel down to Egypt, and would actually begin to kick off all of the situation of the Exodus. Because when uh, Israel was in Exodus, what happened to them? They became a great, huge vine. They became numerous. And, they, and God would deliver them from Egypt and bring them into the land of Israel. But listen to how Psalm 80 refers to this Exodus story. Psalm 80 says, You, God, brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and you planted the vine. You cleared the ground for it and it took deep root and filled the land. So this is how the psalmist in Psalm 80 describes the ex exodus, conquest, and settling of the land. Israel had become a great vine in Egypt. God took that vine. He wanted to transplant it. First thing he did was get rid of the rocks of the Canaanites, clear the land, make the land good for Israel, and took that vine and planted it in the good land there in Palestine. There it took root and began to fill all of the land. The psalm goes on to describe the time of David and Solomon and said, The mountains were covered with the shade of this vine. The mighty cedars were covered with the branches of this vine. The vine sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. And so this is a picture of the glory of Israel, how they expanded throughout all of the land that God had given them. And we can think of all the great things that David and Solomon did, where Solomon was accumulating gold, bringing in glory, and so that all the nations of the earth were looking at Solomon's kingdom and saying, that is the best thing we have ever seen. It is glorious and it is beautiful. But after the Psalms tells the story about this vine that God had brought out of Egypt, transplanted, and it's become glorious, the psalm then changes and it says, Why then, O Lord, have you removed the protective wall? Why do you let anyone who passes by this vine feast on its fruit? Why do you let wild animals ravage and roam around the vine? Turn, O God, look upon your vine once again. Isaiah in chapter 5 tells a very similar story, but also provides the answer to the question of Psalm uh, 80. In Isaiah 5, he says, My beloved God had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and he cleared it of stones and planted it with a choice vine. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewn out a wine vat in it. Once again, God cleared the land. God planted the vine. This time, he builds up a, a tower in order to protect it from intruders. But we see in the very next verse in Isaiah, the problem. When God went out to collect all of the good fruit from his vine, what he found was wild grapes instead of good fruit. What he found was bad fruit instead of good fruit. So God delivered the people, brought them into the land, bestowed upon them blessing upon blessing, protected them, delivered them. And when he came looking to them, inspecting them for fruit, harvesting in the good fruit of obedience, of worship, of justice, of love of God and of neighbor, he found none of that. When he came looking for the good fruit that Israel was supposed to be producing in covenant in relationship with God, what God found again instead was the fruit of bitterness, the fruit of false worship, the fruit of pride, the fruit of idolatry. And therefore, because he said, this, if this vine is not producing good fruit, it has become worthless, I am going to let the nations in. He broke down the walls. He allowed the nations to ravage the land. And now in Ezekiel 15, this vine that has been fruitless is now good for nothing else except for fire. And when we turn to the opening pages of the New Testament, we see a very similar message. When we open up, look at the book of uh, Matthew chapter 3, we see John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. And when he saw all the Pharisees and all the Sadducees coming to him, he cries out to them that they must be trees that bear good fruit. He said it's not good enough for them just to claim, well, if you look at our roots, our roots are in Abraham. We have Abraham as our father. He said that is not enough. You cannot just point to your root 
And you cannot just point to your forefathers, but you must bear the fruit of faithfulness just like Abraham. Anyone who does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown to the fire. The axe is already laid to the root of the tree. John the Baptist declares to them. And so what we see again and again in Scripture is that God's people are to be fruitful vines and fruitful trees. We see the grace in which God treats them. He is the one that clears away the stony ground. He is the one that prepares them to plant. He is the one that plants them. He is the one that protects them. He is the one that waters them. He is the one that causes the growth. But despite of all that grace, in spite of all that kindness, the people only produce evil fruit. Fruit that is worthy of judgment. Fruit that will cause them to be cut off. Fruit that renders them worthless. Despite God's grace, despite God's kindness, no one is righteous. No one has been found bearing the fruit that God desires. But all of this changes in the night in which Jesus was betrayed. In the book of John, after Jesus ate the Last Supper with his disciples, he goes out with them and he has a, a meeting with him and his disciples, an intimate conversation with him and his disciples. And there he declares to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. In these verses, we see the truth that we already see throughout all of Scripture, that any branch that does not bear good fruit that God is looking for is cut off by God, who is the vine dresser. Those branches that are cut off are good for nothing except the fire. But despite that uh, sameness that is, we find throughout the story of vines in the Bible, look at all the radical differences and change that occurs in these verses. For now, the vine is no longer Israel, but Jesus says that he is the true vine. The vine that is unlike the wicked and fruitless vine that we find throughout all of history. And if Jesus is the true vine, then that means that everyone that is united to him, everyone that has come to him by faith, are branches of that vine. And therefore, we are called to abide in him. Now, I think we can see three things from this call to abide in the vine. The first thing is that this is all of grace. That we are connected to the vine, not because of any worthiness that we have done, anything that is in us, but rather it is the vine dresser that has brought us into the vine. It is God's work that connects us to Jesus Christ. It is God who makes us branches on his vine. Jesus is the one who, is, who gives life. He is the one that gives nourishment to his people. The Father is the gardener who grafts us into Christ. He is the one that has cleared the, the rocks and the stones out of our hard hearts. He is the one that has given us life. It is his work from first to last. Secondly, abiding in Christ means that we will receive his grace and his love. Later on in this passage, Christ tells his disciples to abide in my love receive and embrace and rest and trust and believe in the love of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, our abiding in Christ means that his word abides in us and therefore we are obedient to his words. A good vine is one that will produce good fruit and we, the people of God, have been brought into a perfect vine. Sinclair Ferguson explains that abiding in Christ means that we allow his word to fill our minds, 
direct our wills, and transform our affections. There is no abiding in Christ if we forsake his teachings. From resting and embracing his grace and his love, we therefore bear good fruit in our lives that God's people have always been called to bear, but have so far been have so far failed to do. And here's the thing you might have noticed if you are paying attention through all of Scripture. Whether it was Adam and Eve, whether it was the Israelites in the land, whether it was the people in the time of Ezekiel, whether it was the Pharisees coming to John the Baptist and to Jesus, at the core of what all of this bad fruit was that led to God's judgment, at the core of the bad fruit that they bore was two things, I believe, and that is pride, their own pride, and always having a lust for more. God's people are people whose lives should always be amazed by grace. Adam and Eve were the highest points of God's creation. Adam and Eve walked face to face with God. Adam and Eve were tasked to rule over the entire world. And still, that was not enough. Still, they wanted more. Still, they wanted to be like God. And in order to achieve that, they reached out and took that fruit in rebellion. Israel should have been amazed at God's grace and bringing them from Egypt and setting them up in a great land, a land that would allow them to flourish. They should have been amazed that God would meet with them in his temple, that God would choose them to be his particular people among all the nations of the earth. They should have recognized and been humbled by such a status that God would bestow upon them. Yet, covenant with God was not enough. They wanted more. They thought they deserved more. And so they reached out and they took to themselves idols and they practiced injustice to get whatever they thought they deserved. Pharisees should have been amazed at God's grace of bringing Israel back into the land after 500 years of rebellion. They definitely should have been amazed that they are living in a time in which God is beginning to work again, in which God is bringing all of his promises about a Messiah, all of his promises that he will come and dwell with his people. God is fulfilling these promises in their lifetime before their very eyes. But what they wanted to do, instead of being amazed at that, they wanted to hold on to their little bit of power, their little bit of reputation that they had, and therefore they refused to follow Jesus Christ. We always want more. We are always prideful in what we have, and we are never satisfied with what we have, and therefore we reach out and want more. We reject God in reaching out and taking for ourselves. And this is why Paul tells us in Romans 11 that when you find yourself on the vine, when you find yourself a recipient of God's grace, do not be proud. Let Israel's past be a warning to you that you too can be cut off if you are puffed up with pride, if you forsake the kindness and the goodness and the grace of God. And we all know that humility is the opposite of pride. And so we think that humility is what we need to cultivate. And while that's true, so often when we seek to give ourselves over to humility, it ends up being versions of false pride or feigned humility. But rather this week, I was struck by how the original ESV translated Paul's command in, 11, in uh, 1120. Do not be proud but stand in awe. Do not be proud, but stand in awe. Perhaps instead of trying to cultivate humility in our heart, what we should do instead that would drive us to humility is stand in awe before God. Awe is what we are called to, and awe is what we should be filled with. If we are to understand the love of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the power and justice and goodness of God, then we would all be continuously filled with all. And this all is the antidote to our pride. Imagine if Adam and Eve had looked around at God's creation and their situation in creation and God covenant with them and his task for them. Instead of saying, I want more and reaching for that apple, that fruit, 
Imagine if they said, how amazing is our situation? How amazing is our God? We can reject everything that the serpent is offering for us because we are filled with an understanding of how great our creator is. Imagine if Israel were to remember how God had delivered them from bondage and slavery, how he had gone before them and cleared out the nation that surround them, how he had planted them and how he had blessed their kingdom. And instead of saying, we want more, we want power, we want our idol, if they would stand before their covenant God and say, wow, God is great towards us. What if the Pharisees saw John the Baptist baptizing? What if they saw Jesus performing miracles, if they heard Jesus preaching, and instead of saying, I want to hold on to my, proud, my pride, my power, my position, they thought God is once again on the move. How amazing that we can witness it. When we stand in awe of what God has done, when we stand amazed by his goodness and his grace towards us, then all the pride and all our lust for more melt away as we stand before his face. And so this is our call, not to be dead branches that are good for nothing, that are unfruitful, but rather to come alive as we are united to Christ, living lives of all before the face of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. And Father, we would we give you thanks for that word of Jesus Christ, that he is the true vine and we are the branches. Father, may it be true of us that we would always abide in him, that we would trust in him, that we would abide in his love. And Father, being united to him, being connected with him, bind to the branches, may we always live lives that bring forth good fruit to the honor and the glory of your name. Amen.